Okay, good evening, everyone, and welcome um, to this lecture. I'm very pleased to welcome you all. My name's Rachel Kerr. I'm a professor of war and society in the Department of War Studies and also deputy head of department. Um, and it's a really great um, honor and a privilege to um, be welcoming you to this event and to be um, presenting our speaker for this evening. Um, the Saki and Michael Dockrell Memorial Lecture is a lecture that we hold annually in the School of Security Studies, um, and it celebrates the dedication, collegiality, and achievements of Professors Saki and Michael Dockrell, who spent very many years um, in the Department of War Studies. They were both um, well-known and eminent um, international and diplomatic historians. Um, in addition to being accomplished scholars and, and publishing um, very widely, they were very generous mentors um, in, in the department and very important for the, for the development of war studies and for scholars within it. And I myself was um, privileged to be a student in the department while Professor Michael Dockrell was still teaching um, and then went on to be able to be as a colleague of Saki Dockrell's um, during her um, later years in the department. Um, they both served very many years, Michael from 1971 to 2001 when he retired, um, and Saki from 1992 to 2009. Um, this memorial lecture is our opportunity to, to um, embody the values that, that they upheld and to um, do our bit to carry forward the work that they did in inspiring the next generations of scholars um, in presenting the latest developments in the field of um, international history, diplomatic history, and war studies um, more broadly. So I'm really pleased to be able to introduce our speaker this evening. It's a very great personal um, privilege and pleasure to introduce um, Professor Beatrice Heuser. Um, it's extremely fitting that um, this is somebody giving this lecture this evening who also embodies um, the values that were espoused by the Doc Rawls of collegiality um, mentoring and inspiration, and has personally been very inspiring to me um, as a mentor and as a role model um, woman, not many of us, there are more of us now, um, working in this field of, of, uh, working in this field of studies. Um, so I, for one, have benefited from her expertise and her advice hugely, and I know many others have. Um, oops, just go forward on that. Um, Professor Heuser has a, holds a BA and an MA from the University of London, and a DPhil from Oxford, and a Habilitation um, Higher Doctorate from the University of Marburg. She's taught um, widely at many places. She spent very many years teaching um, at the Department of War Studies, again, when I had the privilege to be taught by her, um, as well as when I was a student here many years ago. Um, and then during that time, spent a year in NATO headquarters during the Yugoslav Wars. Um, she served as Director of Research at Military History Research Office of the Bundeswehr um, and as a Professor of International Relations at Reading. And she's currently um, Professor of International Relations at Glasgow um, and is seconded at the moment um, back to the Bundeswehr in the Higher Staff College as Director for Strategy. Um, she has many significant publications on nuclear strategy, on Clausewitz, um, and her most recent books, The Evolution of Strategy, and the one that has just come out um, this year, War, a Genealogy of Western Ideas and Practices. Um, and I would recommend anybody starting out in war studies um, to read Reading Clausewitz as um, one of the best introductions to, to Clausewitz if you're feeling a bit lost, um, an essential reading for all budding war studies scholars. Um, her most recent book, as I mentioned, is a, a survey of thinking about war and um, ideas and practices of war, so a genealogy of Western ideas and practices. And she also runs the podcast series with Rusi, Talking Strategy. So this evening, Professor Hoyes is going to talk to us about civilians in war, specifically the civilian conundrum in war. So I will stop there and hand over to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> 
thank you very much, Professor But also, I'd like to thank everybody who's come tonight. I'm really privileged to see people having come from, uh, from yeah, taking time out of busy schedules to be here. But I must say the greatest and the happiest surprise is to see uh, Barry Paskins, because I think he will have the, the answers to the questions that I will raise tonight. And you will also see the profound effect you've had on me uh, because of the thinking that I was subjected to from you that I've tried to find out more about over the years. So, Barry, I'm particularly looking forward to your replies to what I'm going to talk to you about. It is also a great honor to be able to help commemorate in this way Saki and Michael Dockrell, uh, great friends, and I, uh, we all um, lost particularly Saki far too early, and it is wonderful that there is this lecture series to commemorate them, and uh, I'm, I hope that I can uh, be worthy of this particular memory. Here is the structure that I propose to give you. Um, I'm going to bore you to tears to start with, with a long historical introduction, haha. -ha. Uh, I'm going to point to change, where I think I have identified some change, but also to horrendous continuities in the treatment of civilians in war. Uh, to then look at total war nationalism, and then to raise moral issues, and that's where really the uh, political uh, philosophy comes in and the moral and the ethical side comes in. So here we go. If you want to fall asleep, do so during the first two through few bits, but do wake up for section five, because I will, and I really am hoping for, interaction with you afterwards in questions and answers, because I really have the questions rather than the answers. So, um, Having looked in this book um, on the genealogy of, the, of thinking about war and then the contrasting it with practice, at a very long period of time, I was originally also going to, uh, sorry, I've, I've covered um, also this question of how civilians were um, perceived. And uh, one of the things that I found was that in ancient Greece and ancient Rome, um, there was really a very extensive lack of compassion. Just about everybody was killed. Prisoners of war were killed in besieged towns. You had the classic pattern that the population um, could be allowed to surrender, but then they could be, still be expelled. They might still all die of uh, uh, starvation or uh, of exposure if they were expelled from their towns. Um, if they had not surrendered, if a besieged town had been captured, then generally all the men were killed, or else they were enslaved, women were systematically raped, and then they were abducted with children uh, into slavery, and that was a fairly classical pattern there. Um, if you were an insurgent and you were defeated, then you were... Um, most likely going to be killed. There were occasional acts of mercy. Yes, we do find them in, in all sorts of uh, different sources, but they're almost described as a sort of weird luxury. Um, and then so-and-so did something, you know, and men, Im imagine they didn't do the normal thing of killing, but they spared this person or they spared these few people. So uh, Alexander with Darius's wives, it's sort of, they made a big, big fuss about a very um, lim numerically limited case of clemency when a few pages earlier they told us that they had tens of thousands of people killed. And um, it, this comes against the background, of course, where the um, brutality in families is also um, quite different from what we would be expecting today. And not only the Spartans, but also the Romans. Roman fathers had the right to kill their children if they chose. Um, the, there was this, this population control included simply killing infants if you couldn't feed them. And of course, um, Greeks and Romans could kill their own slaves if they felt like it. This was, there was no protection against that. So this comes against the background of an immense tolerance of cruelty and brutality as we would now see it in their societies. What I think this amounts to is that there is an amazing lack of compassion. The Greeks, if they are sparing people they will say that this isn't done in order not to offend the gods. They seem to be more worried about the gods being offended than about these people suffering. Uh, and in the Roman case, it's sort of less the gods, although they get a mention a lot of the time as well, but it's really that it's un disorderly. It's you're, you're breaking the laws, and laws are really the most important thing. You have to go along with the laws. And you do have some people spared in war, and this is um, um, mentioned over in, in several sources. It tends to be people to do with religion in some way. 
So it would be priests, it would be people taking refuge in sanctuaries. We all know that the examples from Thucydides and elsewhere where then the sanctuary is ignored by somebody and the massacre still takes place. But in principle, there are certain rules about sparing people which tend to be related to religion or to sanctuaries in some way, and or religious feasts. Yeah, so it's quite, um, again, it sort of reinforces this pattern of to do with deities and gods rather than with compassion. People don't say don't do this because um, these people would suffer and you don't want people to suffer. It's all about um, we don't want to offend the gods. Um, you do have this in both uh, in one. You do have people suddenly showing sides of, um, you know, this is... A, this is unpleasant, we shouldn't be doing this, at the same time as they're showing extreme cruelty. Just to give one example, Alexander, uh, Alexander III of Macedon, I refuse to call him the Great, um, who uh, was happy to massacre the Thebans and the uh, Tyrians because they hadn't surrendered to him uh, in very large numbers, tens of thousands. Um, but when he came to the Bactrians and found out that the Bactrians had this habit of getting rid of their old people and sick people by throwing them to a breed of dogs who had been trained particularly to attack them and eat them. He thought that was not very civilized and, and, and forbade it. So we do find in one person um, things practiced that we find utterly repulsive and then things that we can sort of relate to. And you can have a nice argument, as uh, historians have had, and I'd love to join in to the, on that, to, uh, on the question of whether Alexander had any business telling the Bactrians not to continue with that because that was cultural interference, wasn't it? Um, you do have, at the end of the Roman Republic, some uh, evidence of humanitarian views creeping in. And I do, um, I, had, I belatedly discovered Cicero, and I, I've, come, I've come to really, really like him, uh, who even says that uh, in, in dealing with enemies, there should be a limit to retribution and punishment. There are certain duties that we owe even to those who have wronged us. It is sufficient that the aggressor should be brought to repent of his wrongdoing in order that he may not repeat the offense and that others may be deterred from doing wrong. And then elsewhere, the rights of war must be strictly observed. And when the victory is won, however, we should spare those who have not been excessively cruel and monstrous. So there is an idea, there's an idea of limitation that does creep in. But I would still argue that uh, somebody must be thinking at the moment that surely the word caritas is Roman. And yes, there was this, the, the, the virtue of, of charity even in Rome. Have you noticed that charity is always depicted as a mother with children? So I would say that's case, in the case of hormones rather than of a mental disposition to be kind towards people who are not yourself, with whom you're not related. So it's interesting that that is the prime example that they had of charity. You know, somebody who, by their hormones, is driven to look after their young. Fascinatingly, one little uh, idea I've come across in archaeology which is that, in fact, compassion also crept in, not, from, not just from single individuals, but from Judaism in Rome in the first century AD, uh, where you've got the thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, is translated, apparently, in a system whereby um, richer Jews in Rome paid for the burial sites of poorer Jews, and that is something that could be found in archaeology that, that uh, uh, Leonard Rutgers and some other archaeologists found out when they looked clear, uh, more closely at the Villa Torlonia catacombs in Rome. Uh, and that's very fascinating because it means that there is an element of social looking after each other which was quite, quite alien to the Romans um, in this respect that creeps in around the time when Christianity also very, very slowly takes off. And I think the argument must, uh, could be made that this love thy neighbor as thyself, the, the, the key, this key point, point which then is fully um, uh, taken into Christianity, um, then becomes a driving factor for the limitation of war and the creation of, or the translation of caritas into something that isn't simply mother's love, hormonal love for the child, but also something that is about caring for people um, who are not at all related to you. So I think the big tournant, the big ch ch change, does really do come when Christianity becomes a state religion and you have the abolition of crucifixion as a punishment, the abolition of lethal uh, circus games, and pretty late still, even actually after the end of the West Roman Empire, uh, the um, attempts, at least, driven by the church to abolish slavery, 
even though um, John Gillingham has shown that in fact the practice of enslavement, particularly of women and children, continued in the Christian West among Christians against each other until the 12th century, which is pretty awful. So the Christian church was actually quite important, I think, in a long fight to drive back two other forces, Western or European civilization being uh, basically an amalgam of, of three important forces, um, one of them being the, the pagan traditions that I was mentioning earlier, uh, but then the, that pretty horrid uh, Germanic warrior culture that comes in with all the invasions and then the collapse of the West Roman Empire, uh, against which the Christian church fought very hard, um, with the result being a set of uh, rules that are gradually introduced. We don't actually know um, when they started, but initially they are very much in the tradition of what we've seen from the ancient Greeks, namely all about religion, all about the protection of what belongs to the church, i.e. the clergy and church property. But very, very gradually, uh, you find that that builds up also to uh, in, in, in some other ways uh, where it says, well, coming, you know, coming near the property of um, Gregory of Tours, or um, sorry, St. Martin of Tours, or become of, of um, Hilaire de po of Poitiers, uh, in that, this area, we shouldn't probably pillage uh, peasants' uh, belongings and things like that. So gradually, an area that is particularly seen as holy also encompasses the poor peasants uh, who should be spared in that area. Um, we have slightly more restrictions already self-imposed on the East Roman Empire in the Morris Strategicon, but in the West it takes a long time for these restrictions to come off. And I've done a bit of research into this, you don't have to read this all, it's just to give you an idea. Very gradually in the 9th century, um, you begin to have more and more protection extended to peasants, to widows, orphans, the poor, um, uh, in the context of saying we want to protect people on the territory through which our armies are moving. And the crucial thing, and I'll come back to this in a moment, the crucial thing is this originally concerned only your own territory. All these ordinances are initially only formulated to say we should protect our own peasants against our soldiers ravaging the land, moving through the land and not only uh, living off the land, but eventually also very often uh, killing the peasant in the process of it, because if you're a peasant and you have enough uh, food for the winter and soldiers come in order to take that from you, you've got the choice between fighting them or dying uh, of starvation over the winter with your family, and therefore you might fight. And then you're probably going to be defeated because you're going to be killed because the soldiers fight better than you. So it's about protecting the poor and the soldiers in your own territory. The other thing that comes up is that you have um, sovereign princes already from Anglo-Saxon England onwards trying to enforce a piece of the land, a protection of their own citizens against interference. And why do I have a gate here of Regent's Park? I hope that some of you at least occasionally wander across Regent's Park, which is a royal park. And at least in my time, when you came into Regent's Park, there was a large panel saying, that you had to follow certain orders in that park, certain rules in that park, one of which was, and we remember that particularly, was not to interfere with the swans. And why was this? Because this was a royal park where, in my time, the queen's peace had to be kept. This idea of the king's peace and the queen's peace is actually a revival, if you like, of the Pax Augusta, the idea of the, 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 an internal peace where only the monarch monopolizes uh, justice and violence and tries to stop everybody else from killing each other in vendettas. Introduced uh, with, um, in the Holy Roman Empire by Emperor Frederick I and then later uh, by um, the famous Landfrieden of the end of the 15th century. But it's interesting how that then spreads alongside this idea of saying, if we're at war and we're moving our forces to the frontier to fight the enemy, on the way we should spare the poor and the peasants and not uh, ravage the land. Um, the Hundred Years' War and the Anglo-Scottish Wars then produce a very large list of um, ordinances which are very interesting because more and more these ideas of these rules that are acceptable to all sides are, um, uh, becomes uh, crystallizes and more and more you have this, the standard uh, line in there that you must spare civilians and you shouldn't go against them. Having said that, we also from these wars have plenty of evidence Again, that this always applied 
to your own side, to the poor and peasants on your own side, and that this protection was only extended very occasionally and selectively to an abbey on the enemy's territory if that abbey surrendered to you with its lands or to a town if that town surrendered to you. So all the, all, all the time, uh, shockingly, I think, for us, it really only applied to our lot, as it were. And this is, I think, where the first big change comes in. And I, uh, curiously, it comes in Burgundy, the late 15th century, um, where it moves from the, the ordinances move from protecting people on your own land to the idea that it should happen to all civilians, including those on enemy territory. I think there is a recognition here, this is in the, in the context of Burg the, the, the uh, Dukes of Burgundy were actually the same family as the French kings, and they kept going to war with each other, um, that there is a sense that they were fighting over the same population and actually wanted to win the allegiance of that population, and therefore it might not be wise to pillage them and to, to kill them uh, if you then afterwards wanted to have their loyalty. But interestingly, this is where you do potentially have a change coming in. At the same time, there's some literature, again, just it's just there, um, which claims that there was a decline of violence, also domestic violence, also the violence in, uh, in small-scale societies, pub brawls or whatever it is, um, in the West in the late 15th to 18th century. I personally can only uh, put, say a heart, this is, this is what they say. Um, but I do at the same time see that there are more and more of these ordinances coming out, and incidentally, um, some of the fun is to, was to find them because they were very often attached as annexes to books on war where you wouldn't have suspected them. So you just suddenly have this, this burgeoning of more and more of these ordinances. Um, some of them simply stand alone. You go to war, you have somebody um, at the beginning of their campaign, and it seemed to be the case that whenever you went to war, whenever you went on a campaign, you had to have, uh, publish these ordinances. Well, the interesting thing about it is that these are unilaterally adopted. It isn't international codes of conduct. It isn't the use in bellow that is somehow agreed internationally, but because everybody starts adopting them and copying from each other, it becomes traditional law. It becomes conventional law. Um, and you had, um, so again, oh yeah, um, the, even until the mid-19th century, we find that ordinances are in such a way are issued ad hoc for an individual um, a campaign. And just to give you a little flavor of one just randomly chosen, the Danish one, upon pain of death are prohibited. Les majesté, all deliberate homicide, murder, sexual conduct against nature, incest, bigamy. Incidentally, rape is not, is not against nature, so rape is exempt from that. Kidnapping, forceful abduction, laying fire, street robbery, highway robbery, stealing church property. So these would be classic cases, and it's quite interesting that a lot of them um, don't actually exclude rape. But yeah, okay, there goes. Horrible continuity at the same time. Absolutely horrendous continuity when it comes to siege warfare. And since antiquity, absolutely systematically, you get the pattern all the way to what we're seeing in Ukraine now, that if a city surrenders on certain conditions, the besieged forces on the whole are expected to uh, respect the conditions and then also not to pillage, not to rape, not to kill. But if the city does not surrender but is taken, everything is allowed. And that is something, is simply a practice that we see uh, all over. And just to have a, an example, um, uh, of this, you have, st uh, the, of course, the element there of starving civilian populations until they surrender, scorched earth tactics around places so that they, they run out of food, um, naval blockade as in the naval dimension of this, bombardment uh, from land or from the air once you have the technology to do that. And then uh, the, the sacking, as I said, continues clearly from antiquity to the present. We have there those pictures from Mariupol. Uh, quite recently, but we could add all the horrible pictures that we have seen since. Um, Erasmus of Rotterdam already commented that it was the greatest part of the suffering that falls on those who least deserve to suffer, namely on farmers, old people, wives, orphans, and young girls. If anyone cries that this is, it is unjust not to punish a sinner, my answer is that it is much more unjust to call down absolute disaster on so many thousands of innocents who have not deserved it. So it was quite clear for contemporaries that what was going on, um, so war should not be seen primarily just as the clashing of armies. Religious wars and national wars, well, those two types of wars where um, all sides had it in particularly and including for uh, the 
um, uh, uh, anybody, every single person, all the civilians, because it meant that this was a battle of uh, good and evil, and if you were in your soul, you were on that other side, you were an enemy of your deity, if you're, it was a religious war. So you had that as an element in the Muslim wars of conquest in 1630, 630. The, uh, the atrocities committed in the, by the Crusaders when they captured Jerusalem, just as one of the many atrocities of the, of the um, Crusades, but also in the confessional wars then of the early 15th century and then the, the, uh, the religious underpinned wars of the 16th century and the early 17th century, the wars of conquest and the um, Spanish-Dutch 80 years war all of which were particularly horrendous with regard and merciless, as every single civilian on the other side was very often treated as an adversary, whether they were a, a babe in arms or whether they were an old person or whatever. There is a big uh, debate among scholars about the violence in the Thirty Years' War. There's one school which says um, there was, uh, the, the Thirty Years' War was a particular um, height of deliberate cruelty, whereas the other school of historians speaks particularly about the indirect effects that led to so many casualties in this war, which were up to a third of the population of some of the areas concerned, um, where th this particular school claims it was mainly because of famine and plague that so many people died. Um, I have a tendency to uh, side with those who say that there was the deliberate cruelty that was inflicted, um, and that this was, it was a myth that the cabinet wars that followed after that were so very limited. Where does this myth come from? Just a very brief um, run through that because it's quite interesting. It, it comes up an awful lot in uh, uh, literature about strategy. Um, called in French, lace warfare, la guerre en dentelle. Uh, we know that it goes, definitely goes back to the French author Guibert, who thought that the wars of the, uh, that he'd witnessed his own time, particularly the Seven Years' War, um, were very unsatisfactory because people were always stopping the war whenever they ran out of money and then they resumed when the money um, came back and this, was, and this was decided by cabinets, hence the word cabinet wars. Um, it was picked up by Clausewitz, who cribbed an awful lot from uh, uh, Guibert, uh, where he had this whole passage saying armies were paid for from the treasury, which princes treated almost like their privy purse. Apart from a few commercial issues, relations with other states concerned the treasury or the governments, not the people. War thus became the business exclusively of the government, hence cabinet, yeah. War thus essentially became a real game, looting and devastation of enemy territory, which had played such an important part in the warfare of the ancients and even in the Middle Ages, were no longer regarded as acceptable to the spirit of the age. War was thus limited more and more to the armed forces themselves. This is what Clausewitz wrote. He had never experienced them. He wrote that retrospectively, taking this inspiration uh, from Guibert, practically paraphrasing Guibert, and that particular um, interpretation of the wars before the French Revolution, particularly of the 18th century, was then picked up by an awful lot of other people. Moltke picked it up, Karl Schmitt infamously picked it up, and there was this whole argument, therefore, that this is um, that there was the limited period of cabinet warfare uh, until, I think, Hervé Drevillon started writing about this period and said, no, actually, it was pretty horrendous. Um, some of the, the little things that he uh, mentioned uh, as ex examples of this, first of all, lots of cities burned, lots of looting of the cities, bombardment of cities on the right-hand side. You will see a picture of the city of Dresden. Um, it's not just uh, 14th of February 1944 that it was bombed. It was already bombed in 1760 from the ground and destroyed, and this is why so much of the center of Dresden was then late 18th century. Um, the uh, wars of Louis XIV were horrendous for, and had horrendous effects for the people who um, were in the areas where he had this scorched earth politics uh, tactics um, and uh, where masses of people died from starvation. But also, um, as Hervé Drevillon underscores, uh, drilled forces firing at each other in lines and advancing towards each other had very high casualty rates, more uh, higher casualty rates per soldiers than you had in previous and later wars. So this is um, really, it was particularly also for the soldiers, a particularly bloody business and the idea that the cabinet wars were so limited. Um, not necessarily the case, but in any case, it, we could, it did, however, it seems, get worse once you got back to a model in which an ideology inspired people to think that all enemies, the entire enemy population, was the adversary. And that's really when 
religion was now replaced by nationalism. And nationalist wars, I think, by logic and uh, reason, drift into being total wars because in that context, it starts with the French Revolution. Not only do you uh, mobilize your entire own population, i.e. the entire nation against an assault by the adversary against your nation, it's no longer just your dynasty, but you then logically have to start sooner or later to think that therefore every member of the other side is also an adversary, every single human being in the other nation. Let's pass review what people have thought about that and go back a step, just go back to how people at some stage said, thought this was not the case. Plato would not admit that the whole people, uh, the whole people of a state or a Greek polity, men, women, and children, are enemies, but only the hostile minority who are responsible for the quarrel. So for Plato, it was decidedly not the entire polis who should be treated like that. In the late 18th century, you have Vatel saying, women, children, the old, and the sick come under the description of enemies, and we have certain rights over them, but these are enemies who make no resistance, and consequently, we have no right to maltreat their persons or use any violence against them, much less to take away their lives. This is so plainly a maxim of justice and humanity that at present, every nation, in the least degree civilized, acquiesces in it. So in the, at least the, the, the theory <clears throat> um, was that you couldn't do that before the French Revolution and before the rise of nationalism. But then the big turning point comes with the introduction of nationalism, and all of a sudden you see quite different t views taken by the jurists of the 19th century. The US Supreme Court in 1814 said in the state of war, nation is known to nation only by their armed exterior, each threatening the other with conquests or annihilation. Or a Leipzig jurist, at the university, Julius Weisker, saying 1845, the war of nations sees in each member of the enemy people an enemy who has to be fought or at least disarmed. Or Halleck, um, a bit later, this again a jurist, um, the state of war means that the whole state is placed in the legal attitude of a belligerent towards another state so that every member of the, if the one nation is authorized to commit hostilities against every member of the other. So clearly this idea of the mobilization, the entire mobilization of one's own people and then the uh, designation of the entire population of the other side as enemies in every place and under every circumstance. Thus, there are in two ideological contexts, you get the entire population as enemy, namely if they're enemies of God, in Islam versus Christendom, or the confessional wars among Christian denominations, or if they're enemies of a nation, where you have warfare of nation against nation, as just described, or even then the genocidal war as practiced by Ludendorff, who actually uh, formulated this out and went to the last uh, logic of this. Why am I telling you all this? Well, I think it's really important to see that Europe had produced an ethical a spectrum of attitudes towards civilians, which goes all the way, and these are all European traditions, from uh, Mother Teresa to Adolf Eichmann. All these are contained in European traditions, and they were competing with each other. You do have, in the 19th century, in parallel and competing with each other, the jurists trying to create more rules that are internationally accepted with a whole legislation movement, incidentally strongly supported, if not even championed, by Russia with the Tsar's main jurists who tried to convene those first St. Petersburg Declaration, etc. These, these first uh, international treaty efforts. Uh, whereas at the same time, in parallel, you have this increasing development of the nationalization of war with this drift towards identifying the entire enemy population as enemies. This good, or this, this ethically good side of it, the pr greater protection of civilians by international law, international law for the first time now turning from traditional law and simply conventional law to, uh, to treaties that are signed by various sides, by multiple sides. Um, um, this, this, this tradition, of course, um, only takes off in the second half of the 19th century. 
and is uh, illustrated by this very long list that all jurists will immediately recognize um, of legislation that is uh, so supposed to afford protection to civilians, but also for prisoners of war, to fighting soldiers, etc. Um, I've highlighted the very important uh, Hague draft rules of aerial warfare, the one exception herein, which wasn't ratified by the various sides, which was why uh, bombing from the air was still legitimate legal in the Second World War. Uh, but all the other um, uh, legislation progressively tried to humanize warfare, tried to restrain Bologna, tried to increase the rights of civilians and the protection for civilians, but also of wounded soldiers, captured soldiers, etc. Aerial bombardment becomes this large and very important exception. Um, developed nicely in the uh, colonial context uh, because it was a cheap form of counterinsurgency. You didn't, you didn't need to put boots on the ground um, in the Second World War, the alternative to early invasion, of course, and then uh, only really properly uh, did, um, uh, outlawed with the um, uh, new um, uh, appendixes to the Geneva Protocols of 1977. So we are in, I think in agreement, everybody, that what Russian forces are doing in, by bombing um, uh, civilian properties in Ukraine that is a war crime. But even then, we find that there's um, the odd return to this thinking that you had in the Middle Ages before the Burgundians uh, afforded something of a change, um, that people, um, militaries tend to be very concerned about uh, saving forces on their own side, force protection on their own side, and this whole development with the, in the context of using um, missiles or aerial bombardment of trying to achieve a war with zero dead, tended always to be about zero dead on one's own side, so let's, let's not mistake that for a particular humane form of war. Uh, the extremes, of course, of the nationalization of warfare are then in, in Genoa and Democide, uh, where the classic cases are st the still, the jury is still out, or put it that way, I don't know enough about it to be able to decide whether it was uh, neglect or deliberate and incompetence or deliberate policy, the Holodomor. The Great Chinese Famine are uh, mentioned in that context. There are two schools on each of these. One of them says it's deliberate. The other says it was just extreme incompetence. But design was definitely there in the German genocide of the Nama and the Hereros, um, the Turkish genocide of the Armenians, the German genocide of Slavs, Jews, Sinti, Roma, and um, the Pol Pot's genocide uh, in Kampuchea. Um, the Rwandan genocide was by design, and of course, Repinitsa was by design, although on a different scale. But still, um, there's, there's clearly, that's the, the pinnacle of that. Okay, this is the bit where I hope you're going to wake up, because this is the bit where I will now need you. So far, we have considered the killing of clearly innocent people. But this is now the conundrum and the moral dilemma that I want to raise which is how responsible are citizens for their government's wars? And I've then restrained it or restricted it by saying, let's assume um, they are um, in a democracy, but even in more authoritarian systems, one should raise that question. So in this context, uh, can we differentiate between Innocence in the sense of those who really cannot do any harm, that's where the word comes from, in nocura, nocura do harm, not nocura, not doing any harm. Um, citizens of a totalitarian system which, who may just have the choice between being incarcerated, possibly even shot, if they go against the government anyway, so one would say that not everybody's born to be a martyr uh, from... Um, me, in any case, I would have been, always been very worried about uh, standing up against the uh, government if I had children to look after or a family to feed or something like that. Um, the active and voluntary professional contribution to a war effort, which is still on a different scale, you know, if you actually joined the Nazi party or if you, joined, if you volunteered for the military, um, and if you're actually uh, combatants um, in, uh, in that war yourself. Let's, for the purpose of this part of the discussion, leave aside the question whether it would actually be physically possible in a war to differentiate between these people. We should come back to that at the end because I think there might be interesting technological developments in the future that might make this uh, turn this something somewhat around. So, let me repeat, there are degrees of responsibility um, whether this comes from voting for a party that proclaims war to be its aim, um, 
or not protesting as a government uh, against a government when it embarks on a, something that you think is wrong, um, morally supporting such a government's war and actively supporting it um, by civilian or then military work in, um, in support of that economy. Well, let me now just run past you some different views that have been taken on the subject. And it's not uninteresting that Christine de Pizan, uh, early in the um, 15th century, who herself was writing at the court of the French king at the time, during a time of civil war, just to take you back, um, you all know about the Wars of the Roses in England, where you had exactly the same thing a generation earlier in France, the Armagnac against the Bourguignon, which was basically another family feud led by two different factions of the royal family, two uncles of the king, who, just like Henry VI in late, the later uh, English case, um, Charles VI was, uh, had, was insane, had uh, great periods in which he couldn't reign, and the uncles uh, fought each other. And in this context of civil war, um, a, a Christine de Pizan came to the following a very interesting verdict. Let us suppose that the people of the enemy country, or is it the enemy faction, because it's, it's left open, wished not to aid their king or in, in injuring our king. Okay, the other side doesn't want to um, aid their side. Okay, in accordance with lawful practice, we should not in any way cause bodily harm to or injure the property of such people or those who did not come to the aid of the enemy king. So if the other side abstains from supporting our enemy king, we shouldn't harm them. Mm -hmm. By contrast, if the subjects of that enemy king, be they poor or rich, farmers or anything else, give aid and comfort to him to maintain the war according to military right, we may overrun their country and seize what they find, prisoners of whatever class and all manner of things without being obliged by any law to return the same. So interestingly, here in a monarchy, which is you know, pretty close at the stage, we have no electoral system here, people hadn't chosen by any election their king, um, she still assumes that there is a choice to be made by people, whether they support this other uh, ruler or not, and that they deserve to be treated accordingly. Grotius, several centuries later, um, says, to start with, the civil community is one body with a sovereign head, thus no separation of interest between those of the prince and his subjects should be allowed. Not only those who actually bear arms, or who are immediately subjects of the belligerent power, are our enemy, but even all who are within the hostile territories. So interestingly, there again, the assumption is made that the property of the enemy monarch and the subjects of the enemy monarch are all collectively also um, the enemy's property as such, extensions of the adversary. Um, Cornelius von Bakershoek, in his Questions of Public Law, um, thought that the war is an attempt to job subjugate the enemy and all that he has by seizing all the power that the sovereign has over the state. That is to say, by exercising complete dominion over all persons and all things contained in that state. But that's a sort of, still a benign thing because it, may, it doesn't at all suggest that you're going to kill them. But it does still have this perception that the population is the sovereign's property, so to speak. Uh, we don't see here these, uh, this fascinating argument that is made by Christine de Pizan that, that, that suggests that they have a choice about this. Much of the contrary, both um, Grotius and uh, Binkersog um, give this impression that basically the, the, the subjects are just extensions, almost property of the monarch. Um, but let's get back to this idea of uh, Christine de Pizan's, which is, it, it strikes us as being much more modern and in some way much more worrying, of course, in the same way. Um, so here this question of are they responsible, do they have a choice? Let me introduce you to the thinking of somebody who was so out of tune with the rest of her environment and the rest of her, the thinking around her, that people spotted her as being very exceptional and appointed her to chair of philosophy in Oxford in the Second World War, the Catholic philosopher Hanscom, uh, who was totally against the bombing strategy um, that was adopted by the British and of course the Americans in the Second World War, um, where she pleaded for a, a clear distinction by occupation between people who in some way supported the war effort and some people who didn't, 
Um, she said that innocent uh, civilians could be, in her opinion, identified even in what others called total war. They are those who are not fighting and not engaged in supplying those who are with the means of fighting. A farmer growing wheat, which may be eaten by the troops, is not supplying them with the means of fighting. So she was very clear that there were these different categories. Um, I think for many other people, and for many of her critics, of course, this distinction was not as clear cut. But there is this position uh, on the very extreme side that you can differentiate and that there are jobs in which you are wholly innocent. Um, again, on the other end of the spectrum, uh, saying that you haven't got anybody innocent, but anybody who supports a government who does something that is, is wrong. Uh, we will find on the arguments that Islamic, uh, Islamist, sorry, Islamist terrorists have um, put forward, you find the uh, Osama bin Laden saying uh, that um, basically if you bomb my population, we bomb yours. Um, we issue a fatwa to all Muslims. The ruling to kill the Americans and their allies, civilians and military, is an individual duty for every Muslim who can do it in any country in which it is possible to do so as an act of retribution, because he saw that as uh, something he argued that was equivalent. It is a fundamental principle of any democracy that the people choose their leaders and as such approve and are parties to the actions of their elected leaders. By electing their leaders, the American people have given their consent to the incarceration of the Palestinian people and the slaughter of the children of Iraq. This is why the American people are not innocent. The American people are active members in all these crimes. So this assumption here that by having just voted for a particular government in advance, you're already making yourself uh, culpable uh, of any later um, deeds committed. So an extreme position there on this, this long spectrum that I'm showing you. But also, very interestingly, um, in the context of the uh, Yugoslav wars, and here in particular the uh, Kosovo campaign, um, air campaign that NATO conducted against Serbia in particular, um, we had Barry Buzan uh, arguing that um, people get the government they deserve. And most, a lot of people in this room are too young. Many of us, you, you are not, but let me just, for the younger ones, remind you what happened there. Um, the Serbs got so, um, or the, the rest Yugoslavia population, got so um, angry about this. If you were Serb, you'd probably feel the same at that stage. Um, that they started painting targets on themselves, or on their, their, their prams, or on uh, um, their hats and things. And they deliberately said, well, NATO is going to bomb us, so we are the targets. Come on, bomb us. Um, to which Barry Dubuzan argued that if Serb civilians turned themselves into human civilian shields by occupying key bridges in order to prevent NATO from blowing them up from the air, then these Serbs were, in his view, legitimate targets. So here, a much greater engagement on the part of the population in support of a particular policy. But on the spectrum, you can see that this is a, a debate definitely worth having. Lord Guthrie of Craigie Bank and Sir Michael Quinlan took a slightly different angle on this. And they said, well, let's not talk so much about whether they were responsible for getting a government into power, and let's look simply at what they are doing at the time of a confrontation. So in their book about just war, uh, they said that the concept of innocence as people who should not be deliberately attacked does not turn upon whether these individuals in question had any personal responsibility for the evils which our engaging in war is intended to terminate or rectify, i.e., let's disregard whether they were involved in voting for that government or anything like that. The word innocent, they suggested, should be used to refer to whether or not they are involved. Their own willingness or reluctance is not relevant in contributing to do us harm whether in different terminology, they are or are not essentially non-combatants. A different take on it, which makes it easier to distinguish between whether you will uh, try to punish somebody for a decision that they've made in the past or even are sustaining in the present, or whether you are trying to target them or you, you, are, you think, think it is legitimate to go for them because they are actively involved in the war effort. So back to the question of the active involvement in the war effort rather than the punitive responsibility for something that happened uh, earlier. Um, finally, perhaps the philosopher uh, David Luban, who uh, dwelt on this question of whether this is a, a war can be seen or should be seen as a punishment, uh, where he said, democratic states 
may be even more collectively guilty of international crimes than undemocratic ones, be precisely because their regimes rely more heavily on popular support. But we should reject a conception of collective guilt that can lead to the death or maiming or loss of possession of anyone in a guilty population. Anyone here meaning they could indiscriminately take out people irrespective of whether they have supported these war crimes or not. Yeah, so the only one is the, the, the indiscriminate uh, uh, bit. Nevertheless, justice, uh, injustice arises from the fact that the disasters of war are distributed among the enemy population without regard to their individual guilt. And this gets back to the big question of can you, would there even be a possibility for differentiating in targeting between people who've supported that government and people who've not? So imagine a situation whereby you had in... Um, say Germany in late 1932, I think when the last free elections were, when you had whole areas, cities even, where um, the popular vote had gone very strongly against the Nazis, would you feel that these people were not supporters of the Nazis and therefore deserved punishment less than people in populations and cities who had in the great majority voted for the Nazi in, the, in those elections? Um, but even then, of course, you'd still have those minorities. You'd still have minorities in each side that had sided with the other side. Could you differentiate? How could you um, make that difference? So that in a way, we are led more and more to think about the question of whether there might be the means in any way in warfare to distinguish. To recap, civilians in European history were not always seen as great treasures to be protected, those parts of the population that were the most vulnerable and therefore the most worthy of protection. Christianity, with its roots in Judaism, in this very interesting combination of, first of all, looking about, uh, after your own poor, started to change that, but it took a heck of a long time for this to penetrate. It took an even longer time for this to be applied to the populations of enemy countries and to see some sort of distinction. And yet there is a standing and very, very long debate about whether in fact the population of an enemy country should be seen as innocent or whether they are actually particularly in a democratic system or if they are the subjects of, a, of a, an, an enemy monarch or in any way part of an extension of that enemy should be particularly targeted if they are actually very much part of the enemy to be targeted. So you have two parallel traditions from that point onwards. On the one hand, the tradition of trying to limit the destruction in war, the collateral damage, the, the, the killing and particularly of civilian populations the, to try to limit the effects on civilian populations, first just on your own side, but increasingly also through international law on the other side, which is what the, all the international laws we have stand for. And in parallel to that, a tradition which particularly demonizes the entire enemy population. And in any case, we are very much left with the question of whether it would even be possible to differentiate between those in the population of an adversarial state who are supporting that state and its war, imagine an illegitimate war, and those who are silent objectors, who are trying to keep out of it and who are not supporting this. To end then on the context of the Russian war against Ukraine, we are beginning to see, we have already seen uh, in practice for a long time, um, since 2014 is uh, the um, latest, a, an attempts made to distinguish, to punish selectively, to put pressure selectively on supporters of that regime where they can be identified with the sanctions on oligarchs and sanctions on a media who have been particularly um, virulent in their campaigning against uh, uh, Ukraine in the context of that war. Um, but we also see the um, application of economic sanctions, which more indiscriminately um, uh, affect the uh, Russians more generally. Um, we have the whole debate about whether Russian citizens should no longer be allowed to come to the, Euro the European Union countries. Uh, Finland was particularly leading in that and has Im uh, imposed its own restrictions on that. So that's an indiscriminate, if you like, targeting. 
Um, and then my question for you, and this is where I'm hoping very much that our debate will be of interest, um, what other measures would be appropriate? And just as a little um, tickler for your imagination, um, can you think of ways in which in the future um, these things can be spread to a larger number of people? Now, before you immediately dismiss that, I'm not for a second uh, saying um, bomb uh, Russian cities from the air or anything like that. But we should also start with saying what have the Russians been doing to Western countries for quite a while. Um, hands up anybody in this audience who has already been subject to Russian hacking, internet hacking. Um, um, so, I mean, there's already stuff going on in that respect. You know, we, people, individuals are uh, identified as being as saying things which are hostile to the Russian government, and at some stage you will you'll get interesting emails or your friends will get interesting emails and write you nasty letters saying, why have you just, etc. cetera. Um, so this is, this is one way of, of, of doing this, but I think there is much more that can be imagined. It is pretty, you know, with all the sort of new technology coming up where we can identify the actual soldiers, where we can identify the actual soldiers who um, shot off that missile uh, that brought down the Malaysian airliner in, in, in 2014. Uh, well, the other side can do that too. I mean, more and more it is possible to identify people, to, to, um, to target people in that particular way. And I think there are a lot of things that are already going on. Think of uh, how uh, Russians have, or somebody has, um, made assassination attempts and some very successful to um, f Russian um, uh, former spies in the West, um, but all sorts of other things that can be done and then might be done in the future. I think it's something that probably is going to come. But I still want to leave the question with you what you think would be appropriate, to what extent you would formulate that in terms of punishment because they have an opinion that you don't share and they're supporting a regime that you think is wrong, and to what extent this would be a more practical way of putting pressure on them in order to stop them from supporting their government and where you can go with this. And I'm very much looking forward to the discussion, um, but if you wanted to have more uh, examples of uh, what I've said, this all in my book, uh, War, a Genealogy. And for the purpose of the discussion, I'm going to sit down. Thank you very much.